Welcome to ANN In Depth. In this episode, we want to help you understand Adventist publishing. Seventh day Adventists have been known to print, sell, and distribute books in their hundreds of millions over the last 174 years. Now, you may be wondering why do you do that? Why is it that the Adventist Church is committed to publishing even when new technologies keep coming? In order to answer these questions and help you understand the importance of publishing to the Adventist Church, we have here Steve Apollo, the Associate Director of the Publishing Department of the World Headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Pastor Apollo, welcome to ANN In Depth. Thank you, Sam. So what exactly do you do in the department? Um, I do all sorts of things uh, because the department has more than just literature evangelists because many people think of the department as just literature evangelists. Um, basically, we've divided our department into three core areas. Uh, that is student literature evangelists, regular literature evangelists, meaning full-time and part-timers. And then we have what we call um, the missionary book project, which involves church members. And so I'm involved a lot with students and partly with uh, the regular program, but I'm also involved with the communication aspect of the department, our social media, our newsletters, our magazines, that kind of stuff. Okay, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit further into what literature evangelists are and, and what does that mean. Mm -hmm. But let's start with, with history. We didn't have enough money to buy the first printing press, but we knew we needed it. Yes. We didn't even have a name at the time, but yeah. we knew we needed to start publishing. It was the latest technology. We mm -hmm. wanted to reach as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. How significant was it that we used publishing in the 1840s? Well, in your question, you have attributed to why it was significant that this was the technology of the time, the printing press. Um, Martin Luther said that the printing press is God's greatest grace to mankind because it is through this that um, the scriptures were spread so much and so fast. And through the printing press, the world got to get the message quickly because you know when you sit down to write something, it, it takes forever. Um, I know there was a time we took a trip to Israel and uh, we were talking to our guides about the, the scrolls that were done. And I asked, how much would it take to make a similar scroll today as opposed to when it was done then? And he said, it will take an equivalent of 20,000 US dollars to finish one scroll. How much does a Bible or a book cost today? Just a few dollars. So. Uh, publishing, printing is very significant. And we haven't stopped since. How many uh, publishing houses do we have today around the world constantly printing um, and publishing? Today, uh, with a conservative figure, I would say about 60. Uh, there are some that we feel do not operate as full publishing houses, so we don't really count them. But I would say between 60 and 63. The world has changed significantly since then. That's right. So there are many new technologies that have come. Mm -hmm. But there is also new technologies in radio, television, web. Now everybody has a phone and so on. You know, even on social media, when you are, it's the button is called publish. Mm -hmm. So we're publishing everywhere. Everybody's a publisher these days. Mm hmm now, the technology of printing has also evolved, and the industry has also evolved. So today, it, it, it's easier to print and publish using other people's publishing houses. Is there a movement of publishing houses that have uh, stopped buying land and having the actual machinery there and moving toward, let's print this you know, in Asia that is cheaper or elsewhere, or are we still encouraging each area of the world to have their own? Tell me about that development in publishing. Okay. So there is a movement where some of the publishing houses, especially in the developed countries, 
are using cheaper printing presses, which are not just cheaper, but also more efficient than the machines that they have had. Um, we call these uh, editorial houses. Uh, but there are some that still buy the machines. And personally, I believe that it is important for some places to have their own printing facilities. And this has to do with, one, the state of their economies. There are some economies that are really suffering a lot. And so when they import books from outside or when they have them printed elsewhere, the costs really shoot up because you're talking about the fluctuation of the currency. You're looking at the importation. You're looking at duties or all the taxes they have to pay. And we do not know what the future of some of these countries are. You do not know if they will have restrictions on importations and, and things like that. So it only makes sense for them to have their own printing facilities. Now, there are some places where if they did that, their costs would really shoot up very much because you have to take care of the staff their their um you know you, you have a lot of overheads and so it only makes sense uh to use other printing facilities and keep your costs down hmm. nice we publish and print well and distribute uh, millions of books every year and we sell them too. Yes. Why? Why do we sell books? <laughs> well, ministry costs. You need to uh, be able to sustain the ministry. And quite a large part of the publishing ministry is self-sustaining. And so looking at... Uh, Paul's uh, method of ministry, tent maker, I take care of myself while I minister. This is what we encourage in publishing, especially as far as literature evangelists are concerned, that they are self-sustaining church workers. They sell books, sustain themselves, while at the same time they are missionaries. So it makes sense to do this. You, you need the money, you need the business to keep the ministry going. Many places in the world are now Adventists because these literature evangelists, uh, some people call them co-porters, mm -hmm. they have used their own initiative to travel to different lands, to distant lands. This is in the end of the yeah. 1800s, early 1900s especially. Mm -hmm. So there's no Adventist presence in this country, in this island, in this continent. And then they buy books at the time in the U.S. or Europe, and then they would travel to these places, and they would sell those books mm -hmm. in order to survive yeah. and therefore bring the truth, as they saw it, of course, the present truth, to these distant lands. Um, this puts publishing and literature evangelism at the heart of mission because the church could not afford to send missionaries to the whole world. That's right. So the self-sustaining model helped continents and countries. Mm -hmm. Do you still see the need for these missionaries in states and cities that have not been reached? Tell me more about that. I love that question. We are actually currently discussing about how to... Um, have more literature evangelists uh, go out as missionaries in places that are unentered. You cannot talk about unentered places. You cannot talk about trailblazing in mission and ministry without talking about literature evangelism. When you read the history of our church, as you have so rightly said, a lot of the work in most of these places, you go to South America, you go to Inter-America, you go to Asia, China, you go to all these places, people that started what the work were literature evangelists. And so um, it only makes sense to continue with this tradition. Now, I know there are some people that feel that uh, we have radio, we have TV, we can reach these places, we can do that. But 
the essence of literature evangelism or of colportering pot, call is one-on-one -on -one personal touch and personal interaction. This is really at the heart of it all, that when you meet a colporter, they are not just selling you a book, but they are creating contact with you. And maybe if they don't follow up later, a pastor or somebody who comes in there will follow this person up. But they already have met somebody who physically who is a Seventh-day Adventist and who's bringing the message to them. My mother has been worked as a co-porter for over 30 years. I remember you've mentioned that. Yeah, she's yeah. now, um, she paused her co-porting work to plant another church in the south of Brazil. Mm -hmm. I've seen the development of co-porting for many years. So I, the first time that I went to try and sell books, I was 12 years old. Actually, I didn't try, I was forced. Um, <laughs> my mother forced me to do this. And I stayed for a summer trying, you know, going from door to door, selling books to people that did not want to buy books with the money they didn't have to buy those books. Mm. But those books could change their lives. In fact, many people were changed through that literature. Right. And it, it's not cold distribution. You don't just drop a book through somebody's mailbox. You enter their home, you ask them questions, you talk to them, you minister to their needs sometimes. It would be very common to pray for people that you've just met and to minister to them, to bring you know, words of healing, words of hope, um, and, and of course, help them to see that there is more uh, than their current situation. Because it's surprising how many people open up about their lives to a complete stranger. That's right. Um, that they see is, is, is genuinely caring for them. Mm. But you need to sell the books, and more recently, we have seen a shift in culture where people are less inclined to open their doors to strangers. Mm. Uh, there is a, an economic point within uh, even rural areas that they prefer not to. Mm. That people knocking from door to door, there's something that it's, there's something wrong with that. So co-porting has developed into literature evangelism has developed other ways of connecting with people. Mm -hmm. What have you seen as some of those ways? Well, um, human nature has not changed though. Even though people are more weary about opening their doors, they still have needs. They still want somebody to show that they care for them. And for those that are cautious and, 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 and feel weary about exposing themselves to, um, to knocking on somebody's door and, and experience some kind of rejection, it, it, it's good and important to remember that the person behind that door is a human being just like you and they have certain needs. And what we ask culpators to do and, and many of those who are successful realize this, is they pray for divine appointments. God makes the appointments because he's the one who knows who's behind that door. Mm. He's the one who knows who's hurting. Just the way he told Moses, I have seen the suffering of my people. I have heard their cry. I have come down. Now I am sending you. So when the culprita knows that, that God is the one who knows who is in need. So when they wake up in the morning, the first thing they ask God for is a divine appointment. Show me who's in need. Now, other than that, we have focused, lately we've focused a lot on training culprita's on how to um, develop connections with people, gain access to people before they stand before their doors. And some of these methods are using social media, uh, just create uh, an environment of being like an influencer, uh, create a niche for yourself. What kind of niche do you want to meet? Uh, have an online presence, find a way to connect with people on social media, once you develop that connection, once you, you've done that, then you gain access to them. So we've, we've been teaching them about uh, working through Facebook, uh, doing programs on Facebook Live, 
uh, on Zoom. Uh, we also have corporates who work especially through WhatsApp business, uh, email marketing, and all these strategies that current businesses use, we encourage them to do that and, and to use those methods just to gain access. And then from there, have this one-on-one -on -one, uh, touch with the people. One of the shifts that I've noticed mm -hmm. is that while in the past, cold porters would knock on a door, sell the books, maybe come later to deliver it, and likely never see this person again, mm -hmm. the new cold porting seems to be, as you, as you pointed out, creating online communities and creating medium to long-term relationships yes. with the same people. Yes. So you visit them this year and you sell them a book about health. Mm -hmm. And then next year, they ask you about family. So you come and sell a book about family mm -hmm. and then spirituality, and then you're back to health. And mm -hmm. so there is a ongoing medium to long-term relationship of trust, mm -hmm. um, which is very difficult to build. Yes. You don't start and, quickly. And we emphasize service above sales. What does that mean? Uh, um, so service above sales. I can sell a book on, uh, on health, right? But then more than selling you a book about health, I can be a lifestyle coach to you. In other words, I can work with you to build healthier lifestyles, uh, exercise, uh, meditation, uh, Christian meditation, mm -hmm. uh, eating healthy. I, I can show you and teach you how to prepare nice, tasty vegetarian meals or just simple meals that are healthier. So when you have this long-term relationship, you are leaving an influence in this person's life, not online, but in actual physical touch. So we emphasize also service, uh, find a way to provide a service and through this service, live a book. Hmm. That is indeed a shift. How are how many literature evangelists do we have, um, full-time and part-time? Hmm. I don't know if I can give you the full numbers of both full-time and part-time right now because we've had a, a quite a bit of changes happening, especially because of COVID. Some people kind of dropped off a little bit and they're coming back. but. Overall, we have a little over 20,000 literature evangelists. That's a lot. And how, how are they adapting to, to these new realities? It's not been easy. It's not been easy, especially not for everyone. Now, there are some places that were affected a lot by COVID. Work was just totally shut down. There are other places that they were allowed to keep working and, 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 and they went on with business as usual. But there are other places that were not discouraged. They started seeking these new methods and, and the, the where they found where they had a will, they found a way to do this. So I would say some places they have adapted pretty well. Others are a little slower because a good number of our call putters or literature evangelists are elderly people. And so they are not very well versed with technology. And so when we go to meetings with them, we would sit one-on-one -on -one and have to walk them through and say, this is what you do. This, And if you do not know how to do this, talk to your, ch to your son or your daughter or even your grandchildren who are tech savvy, and they will walk you through this because this is their everyday life. If, if there are people listening now who are looking to find a business for the next few years, and they also want to be influencers, they also want to provide some kind of service that helps people, but they want to live from that so that it's not just at 10 o'clock at night trying to, you know, edit a video. Um, what would you, how would you encourage them to become literature evangelists? Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> First of all, they have to think in terms of what do I want to do in mission? What do, I wanna, what do I want to do with my life in terms of being a missionary? Many Christians, Seventh-day Adventists, compartmentalize their lives. They think in terms of this is my work life, this is my church life. 
my church life once a week, six days of the week, I, I live my own life. One day of the week, I dedicate to God. So Adventist on the seventh day. <laughs> There's a song that says the odds of going to heaven are six to one. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, once somebody has decided that they want to have an impact in the life of, lives of others, then they start thinking about what is it that I am passionate about in my life. With, uh, with, with colporting, we have... Uh, health, we have families, we have spiritual aspects. So there's there's a wide variety of ways that you can be an influencer in other people's lives. Very simple example. Um, when I turned 50, I decided I wanted to go back to running. I didn't realize just how big the running community is, and not just among uh, people of my age, but different ages. I signed up on Strava, a social media app for runners, and I found there are different communities in there. So I joined those communities, and through this, I'm able to connect with the people who are not of my faith. Um, I started posting about my journey uh, onwards, and I connected with people that I had lost touch with before, and they started saying, hey, how if a 50-something-year-old man can run, why can't I, a 30-something-year-old man, you know? And so they started looking up to me mm -hmm. for advice about running and stuff like that. And then I used that opportunity to connect with my neighbors who run, you know, and I say, oh, you run, let's run together sometime. And then we create a WhatsApp group and you start building connection from there. So I can use this opportunity to share our health message, our health literature uh, with my neighbors. I, I, I do that. Sometimes I tell them, if you want to eat healthy to be able to run well, this is what you need to eat. This is what you need to cut down on. Then I share with them our health literature and from there build rapport. And that's why I said, if you look at it from the perspective of providing a service, then it's easier for you to connect with the person because you care for them, you care for what their actual needs are, then you're able to find the literature that will meet the needs that they have. For the next episode, Steve, we're going to be talking about the impact of Adventist literature. So mm -hmm. now we talked about why we do it and how. And the next stage, we talk about the impact. We'll also talk about book distribution, mm -hmm. which is it's not unique to the Adventist church, but almost. No, no other group distributes millions of books worldwide. So we're going to be talking about that as well. So until next week, thank you for being here today with us. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching or listening, depending on which platform you're in. I plead with you to subscribe and be connected so that you can learn how the Adventist Church works and operates, and most importantly, why. If you're interested in becoming a Seventh-day Adventist, just get in touch with us or comment here on YouTube or go to Adventist.org and get in touch. If you are a lifelong Adventist, this is also for you as you learn all the complexities of how your church works. Again, we thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week.